but uh, welcome everyone. Um, delighted to welcome everyone to uh, the next iteration, the, the current iteration of the CPP CRDCN uh, uh, webinar partnership. Uh, just want to start by uh, acknowledging that McMaster University, uh, the host institution for the Canadian Research Data Centre Network, is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Uh, beginning this session by giving honour and thanks to the Haudenosaunee and Anish Anishinaabe nations and to recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honour the intimate relationship Indigenous, Indigenous people have to this land. Um, before I turn it over to Tammy, just a few uh, comments to everyone. Uh, we're going to use the Q&A function for chat, uh, for asking questions, um, and uh, we're going to take questions from the presenters after they present. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Tammy to uh, welcome our speakers. Okay, well, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I always enjoy these types of webinars and a chance to see what everyone is working on. Um, I'm here today as one of the co-editors with Canadian Public Policy. Mike Veal is the one who is much more responsible for getting these types of things organized. Um, but I also had the pleasure of working with Pierre Carl Michaud and Kevin Milligan as guest editors for the two special issues with Canadian Public Policy on pensions, retirement, longevity, and long-term care. Uh, the first of these issues was published in November 2022. The second was published February 2023, and it included the papers that will be presented here today. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to thank the Global Risk Institute for sponsoring these special issues. Not only does that help us with the resources required to bring together all of these papers, but it also allows both issues to have full and open access to the public so that subscriptions are not required to access any of the articles published in those two issues. So please do, uh, you know, access those as you please. I'll try to make sure those links are left for you somewhere as easy to find here. Um, now, with that, um, I think that's a good spot for me to stop talking so that we have more time to hear from our speakers today. Uh, each presentation is planned to take roughly 20 to 25 minutes, and then time permitting, we'll take a few questions at the end of the first presentation before moving on to the second. Um, as Grant mentioned, please do leave any questions in the Q&A there. If we don't get to all the questions, we can always gather those up for our presenters to make sure that we pass those along. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our first speakers. We have Janice Compton. She is a professor in the economics department at the University of Manitoba. And we have Marwa Al-Fakri, who has completed her PhD at Duke University and is now a policy researcher at Rand Corporation. And they are presenting life expectancy of couples in Canada. So with that, I'll turn it over to you guys and you can go ahead and bring up your slides. All right, um, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, thanks for organizing this webinar. I'm incredibly thrilled to uh, present our um, recent publication uh, on the life expectancy of Canadian couples. So to start, uh, we'd like to motivate uh, our research uh, with a little bit of discussion about as individuals age, expectation of longevity, meaning how long they expect to be alive, become increasingly important uh, to decision making, especially when it comes to decisions surrounding planning for older age, um, such as savings, uh, retirement, health behaviors, pension take up, and residential location, just to give a few examples. Now, many individuals don't face these decisions alone. Rather, they face them as part of a couple together with a spouse or a partner. Uh, such that these decisions are influenced by how long they expect to live together, which what we refer to, will refer to as joint life expectancy, and the number of years that they, that they expect the surviving spouse to be alive after uh, the death of their spouse, and we'll refer to that throughout the presentation as survivor life expectancy. And while individual expectancies in uh, life expectancies in Canada are uh, easily accessible and well-researched, we don't really have a lot of information on couple-based longevity measures. And the dearth of this information makes it uh, detrimental to couples planning for their older, uh, older age. And to illustrate uh, this point, think about a, a typical Canadian couple approaching usual retirement age. Uh, and 
further assume that the husband and the wife both are at 65 uh, years of age. Now, for this couple, we can look up uh, their life expectancies in the life tables published by Statistics Canada to see that, you know, the woman, uh, the woman's life expectancy is 19.8 years and the man's life expectancy is 15.7 years. Now, these individual life expectancy measures are often used, naively used, to estimate joint and survival life expectancy. Uh, specifically, our naive intuition tells us that for this specific couple, the spouses should expect to be uh, alive for an average of uh, 15.7 years, which is the minimum of the two individual life expectancies. Uh, the husband will die first, and uh, the wife should expect to live about 4.1 years after her spouse's death, which is just the, dif the difference between the two life expectancies. But these naive estimates uh, are wrong because they only compare the means and ignore the distributions of spouses' mortalities and their overlap. Um, as we illustrate in the paper and discuss throughout this presentation, appropriate calculations of life expectancy for the couple have to consider the full overlapping mortality distributions of the couple. Uh, but unfortunately, this error intuition is very common. And here we're going to show you a few examples. The first one being a report from the OECD on pension outlook. And it discusses the falling gender gap in life expectancy and notes incorrectly that the narrowing gap implies a decline in the expected number of years of widowhood. Uh, somewhat closer to home, a Canadian uh, government report on the CPP discusses uh, widowhood years as women tend to live an average of four to five years longer um, uh, than men and get married two years earlier, thus they are expected to continue to require financial support for up to six or seven additional years without their spouse. This misunderstanding and, and overlapping of mortality distributions can lead to poor decisions in households as well. A recent CBC report, uh, or it's an article, um, provides useful advice for uh, CPP survivors' benefit, but it also implies uh, that the difference of life expectancies for men and women were informative for uh, the years or survivors' benefits or survivors' pension. And finally, the recent liberal platform seeks to increase the CPP survivors' benefit by 25%. And given the lack of uh, information and benchmarks that we have for, for couples, uh, one must wonder whether they're accurately estimating the cost of such a program. And in fact, appropriate measures to calculate, appropriate ways to calculate these measures result in very different benchmarks. So to properly estimate the life expectancy, we need to go back to the building blocks and that being the individual mortality rates for men and women. From these, uh, we can calculate the joint mortality rates at each age going forward so that we have uh, the probability that the couple dies over uh, the different years. And with that distribution, then we can calculate the joint life expectancy. Now, for this uh, specific couple that uh, example couple that we were discussing, it turns out that the joint life expectancy ends up being 12.5 years, which is shorter than the naive intuition for 15 years. And then the survivor life expectancies are weighted gender life expectancies. They're weighted by the probability of being widowed at uh, each age, meaning that they're conditional on being widowed. And so for the woman in, in, in this couple, um, her chances of dying first, uh, her, sorry, her chances of being widowed, so being um, uh, predeceased by her spouse uh, is 60%. And she expects to live 11.9 years, which is much, much greater than the 4.1 naive estimate that we got earlier using just the individual life expectancies and our naive intuition for calculating it. For the man, there's a 40% chance of being widowed, meaning that the wife will die first and he is the surviving spouse. And in the case that he is the surviving spouse, he expects uh, to live nine years after her death. And so this is a step in the right direction to think about these uh, couple-based estimates, but uh, they can definitely be more improved with more and richer data.
And so for this slide, what I'm going to talk about is um, examples of different data types that we can have available and how they can be used to estimate these couple-based measures. So the, the appropriate method really is to calculate these couple-based longevity measures really determined by the availability of data. And so starting first with what we've been discussing by using these uh, uh, estimates from life tables, which are readily available and easily accessible, but they're based on cross-section mortality rate, rates, which means that they assume stability and mortality over time. But if we had longitudinal data, then we can follow men and women across time. We can calculate longitudinal mortality rates. And for this example and the, the calculations that we're showing right now, we're using uh, uh, the LAD data and we've moved on from this cross-section estimation of uh, life expectancies to this longitudinal um, way of calculating them. And this undoubtedly results in, as you can see, slightly larger estimates for both uh, the husband's life expectancy, the wife's life expectancy, and both their joint life expectancy together. Now, if we had uh, information on the marital status of individuals as they enter this longitudinal panel of data, we can uh, zero in and only focus on the sample of married men and women and follow them over time, estimate their, uh, estimate the, using only measures for married, uh, for married individuals. And, you know, consistent with what we know about uh, married individuals uh, living longer, you'll see our estimates also go up for both, uh, um, if, for, especially for, uh, for the women and their joint life expectancy. We can also, if, if we had uh, enough data about uh, the couples in, in the longitudinal panel, we can restrict it to couples of similar age. Um, but so far, all of these longitudinal estimates uh, do not account for correlation in uh, the couple's mortality. In essence, it assumes that their, um, mortality are, their mortality rates are independent of each other. Now, to account for correlations, we'll have to have longitudinal data on couples themselves, meaning that we're following an actual couple over time and using that to calculate their joint life expectancy and survivor life expectancy for each um, spouse. As you can imagine, this is very taxing and requires uh, a long panel rich with uh, um, data about both uh, spouses and, and the couple itself. Uh, now we have some information in the lab, but it's a much smaller sample because both spouses will have to be randomly selected to be in the data. Um, and we can calculate their, uh, you know, joint and survival life expectancies for the actual couple. Now, in the re remaining analyses that we will present today, um, we are going to focus on samples of individuals rather than couples. And that's for two main reasons. The first one being sample size, as I had alluded to earlier, uh, while we do have couples in the lead, it's a much smaller sample because it means that both spouses have to be randomly selected to be part of uh, the panel. Uh, and, and so it, uh, considering individuals will allow us to have a bigger sample and allow us to incorporate more covariates so we can look at heterogeneity uh, across different outcomes. And second, we're concerned about sample selection for the couples that are, do end up in the sample. And so, um, you know, the estimates that don't take personal, personal correlations into account, meaning the estimates that only use individuals uh, within the data, uh, we can see that the averages are fairly close because couple correlations only have an impact on the distribution rather than just the averages, which what we will focus uh, for the rest of this presentation. Uh, but I hope uh, the point was made clear through this slide is that, um, you know, with different data available, we can uh, use different uh, methods to get at these couple-based uh, mortality rates. And so... Um, for this paper and what you'll see for the rest of the, this presentation, we'll use the lab data to first estimate couple-based mortality measures, both the joint uh, uh, life expectancy for the couple and the survivor life expectancy by using Gompertz regressions to estimate uh, these rates for husband, wives, and the couple. We also examine how these figures uh, vary by age of the spouse, income, province, and uh, work status. And we do that by expanding the Gompertz estimations on the samples of married individuals to incorporate these select characteristics as covariate. 
Uh, and all of these will be measured in the initial year uh, that we observe uh, the couple. Now I'll hand it over to Janice to walk us through uh, the related rich literature and what we find. Um, okay, so the calculations that we perform in this paper are not new. They've been well understood and are common in actuarial science. However, they haven't been carefully considered in economics or related disciplines. Our economic models of joint decision making surrounding pensions and annuities do incorporate annual joint mortality rates, but don't take it a step forward further to give us the benchmark life expectancy figures that individuals are using when they consider their own subjective mortality. Um, so as noted above, previous Canadian research on life expectancies focuses on individual life expectancies. To our knowledge, ours is the first to look at joint life expectancy measures um, in this more systematic way. We add to the Canadian literature by considering similar correlates. So Wolfson um, looks at uh, income related to life expectancy for individuals. We do the same for couples. Mustard et al. and Amadi and uh, sorry, Brown look at employment. And so we do the same for um, couples. Baker looks at Geography differences, we include geography as a correlate, but we don't look at differences across provinces in this study, maybe something for future research. And then finally, Milligan and Cheryl highlight the importance of using longitudinal data. So that was really our stepping point so that we're looking um, farther from the Canadian life tables and taking it a step further to look at long longitudinal life expectancy for couples. Um, and there's, I'm working with a couple of co-authors looking at similar papers um, in the United States using American data. And again, as Marwa noted, the research is going to be very data specific. So there's different data availability in different countries. And so in the United States, we have some measures that look at race and um, education, but we don't have um, very good income data. We also will be able to follow marriage status over time better in Canada with the lab data than we're able to do in the United States. So we can pick up things in different places. The overall measures are, are um, very similar. So just a, a quick note on the sample that we're looking at specifically with the, with the LAD. So we pick up individuals who are married at age X. So we look at 60, 65, 70, and 75 in the paper. We're going to focus on 65 here today. Um, and we include birth cohorts only where at least 50% of the observations have observed deaths. So for example, we don't pick up people who turned 65 in 2015 because then we only observe them for three years. So I can, I can go over the sample more if anyone has any questions, but we, um, we just calculate some birth cohorts and look at the individual level data. One of the good things here is that Although it is a longitudinal data set and we use the longitudinal mortality rates, we really only need the first years and then the year that they die. And this is good for our data availability because there's a lot of gaps in the lab data where people drop out of the, of the information, but then we do pick them up that the, the year they die. And so we, we have a, a better sample when we're not following them in each year. I did want to highlight that we're only considering the initial marital, marriage status. So we're looking at individuals who begin our sample at age 65 and then move forward. When we think about survivor years, for example, it's not necessarily years in widowhood because we're not going to adjust for whether or not the individual remarries. It's just the years since your husband dies. Likewise, we're not looking at issues of divorce. Um, that is very low percentage in this case. Um, so we're just looking at the initial status of marriage and then looking at death following. Um, and then we can look at correlates of income groups, provinces, and work status, as we mentioned. Okay. So we start with just the basic survivor um, and joint life expectancies, um, which um, Marwa mentioned above. The baseline mortality rates are estimated using the standard Gompertz regressions. We do this separately for men and women and then combine them into synthetic couples 
Um, this is bootstrapped, and so then with those estimates, we can calculate the life expectancy of the couple, and that's our joint life expectancy, and then his and her survivor rates. Um, so again, here's the, the numbers for the um, age 65. Um, that's actually probability she dies first. I keep getting that backwards. I keep making that mistake. Um, okay, and then we add on the correlates. Um, and so here we're looking at, if we want to go to the next slide. Okay, so um, again, because this is tax data, we don't have information on education and race and children and marital history, which might be very interesting for couple mortality. Um, but we, so we, we have to focus on information that's available in the tax files. So we have age gap. Income quintile was calculated for the previous five years. So when we're looking at couples age 65, this is looking at their income quintile from ages 60 to 64. Um, also, we have the proportion of the income earned by the wife, again, for the previous five years, and then look at whether or not the individual is, has positive earnings. So this is basically, are they working or not? So it's positive um, employment earnings in the current year. Um, so I have the, well, just put it up the regression here. I'm not going to go through the, the regression analysis. I just wanted to um, note that these estimates that come in the next few slides are coming from Gompert's regressions. The mortality rates are then calculated for the synthetic couples, bootstrapped, and then we get the joint and survivor life expectancies. Okay, so this is the life expectancies by income quintile. So unsurprisingly, there is a positive monotonic correlation between joint life expectancy and the couple's income quintile. And both because both husband and wife or men and women um, are positively have a sorry, a negative relationship between mortality and income, we do see that um, monotonic increase in the joint life expectancy. There's about a two-year, two and a half year age gap or sorry, not age gap, more life expectancy gap between the lowest and the highest income quintile. For the survivor life expectancy, so her survivor life expectancy is in pink, his is in blue. Uh, there's only about a one year difference between the lowest and highest uh, survivor life expectancy. It's not, it's not a wide variation on average. The U shape is because men's mortality is more sensitive to in income than women. So for example, in the lowest income quintile, that's going to have a larger relationship with men's mortality than women. And so you see that the women's survivor life expectancy is higher than average and the husband's life survivor life expectancy is lower. On the next slide, we have the proportion of income that is earned by the wife. And so here you can see where the traditional couple, where both are earning income, um, but he is earning more than she is, they have the highest joint life expectancy. You can see here that there's, I mean, there's obvious endogeneity going on. Um, individuals, or sorry, couples where the wife is earning the vast majority of income. More probable that the husband is in ill health at this point, and so they have a lower joint life expectancy than average, and her survivor life expectancy has popped right up there. Okay, and then again, we can see similar correlations with the um, positive earnings. So on the next slide where we can see that they have the highest joint life expectancy when both husband and wife are working. Remember, this is age 65. If we look at the age 70, we see the opposite effect, that when they're working at age 70, they have lower uh, joint life expectancy and lower individual life expectancy. Um, and then the, we have, this is also true that when they're both working, they also have higher um, survivor life expectancy. And that's just because that's going to impact both of their life expectancies. So again, it's not just her life expectancy and his, but we have to think about the comparison between them and the full mortality distribution for this. Um, so just to conclude, these are again, just quick initial benchmarks um, to provide information about 
better benchmarks um, for individuals, couples making savings, retiring, retirement and pension decisions. There is a distribution around these benchmarks, just like with individual benchmarks, individual life expectancy. So as individuals, we're going to look at the averages and then think, well, I'm healthier than the average person. I might have a different socioeconomic status. But you have the benchmark, the individual life expectancy on which to, to measure those. That was missing with couple life expectancy. And so that was our goal here to provide those initial benchmarks. Um, in future research, then we would like to look more at that couple data set. So looking specifically at the smaller sample of couples in the lab so that we can get at that correlation a little bit better so that we can look at the impact of spouse's death and consider the widow's curse. And also to look more at the distribution. So not just joint life expectancy, but then say well, how what proportion of couples are likely to both live a long time and or both die very early. So that's what's coming up next. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you both. Um, I, I certainly find this very interesting. I know my own spouse hates it when I point to your research when we're planning um, what we're doing down the road. I don't see any questions in the Q&A yet. So I'll just point out that if anybody does have a question, we have a couple of minutes for that here. Um, but in the meantime, I was hoping perhaps you could uh, offer me a, a quick comment um, in thinking about, you know, my my showing my spouse about your <laughs> estimates here, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of the planning that goes into retirement and savings and all of these things really starts in high gear closer to the age of 50. And I'm wondering if we would end up looking at this just a little bit differently when we take that earlier planning horizon, recognizing, of course, that you guys are going to run into even bigger challenges with the data. I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Oh, I'm already unmuted. Um, yeah, I think I think you're you're exactly right that we can push it back farther and farther. The problem with pushing it back to the age 50, again, we've got that data issue with um, with the we need a long um, a long panel. Um, but also when we think about marriage and divorce issues, um, then you're also going to be hitting a lot of people who are in the, a lot of transition between 50 and 60. And so for the, for the cohort that we were looking at, um, there is very little divorce after age 60 when we're getting up there. You're seeing some remarriage, um, especially more for men. The farther we push that back, then we're, we're going to have to really consider marital transitions more, which means that the lab data is great for that because we can observe them over time for the couples. Um, but yeah, it's going to it would be really data intensive. But yeah, definitely would be something interesting to look at. OK, well, thank you both. Um, since I don't. Oh, did you have a question, Catherine? So your hand I did, but I know I'm cutting into my own time, but you mentioned that you did this as synthetic couples. So I'm just wondering, how do you match people in this data? How do you find love in your in the lad? Uh, so it's just, it's really just looking at the more, so we calculate the mortality rates for men and women. And so we're getting the average there. And we, then we, we sort of, um, we, bootstrap match those. So we're just randomly matching um, the mortality rates. And we actually did this in two different ways. So I can't remember how we did this in the paper. I think we did where we just randomly match individuals. And so it's just, it's not matching on any characteristics. It's just your, um, your 65, we pick out another person who's 65 and match them and look at that. So we did it that way. We also did it where we just calculate the mortality rates for men and for women, and then just mathematically match those with that um, calculating the joint. Um, they work out about the same. Oh. Thanks. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I think with that, then we'll move on to our next presentation, which uh, is with Catherine Derry Armstrong and Roseanne Devlin. They are both professors at Otto or University of Ottawa in the Department of Economics, and they are presenting their paper, Dying at Home, a privilege for those with time and money. So I'll give you the floor, Catherine. Great. I'm just making sure I'm unmuted. Thanks. 
Tammy and thank you, Mike, and thank you, Grant, for this opportunity. So I want to start our talk by explaining to you or trying to motivate what, what is our interest in end of life care and more broadly and then home care, not home care, home death more specifically. So why do we, why should you care about end of life care? Because it's expensive, right? We spend a lot of money on it at the end of life. Uh, the best example we could provide is from Ontario, where we find that 10% of Ontario's healthcare expenditures, so about $4.7 billion a year, is spent on end of life care. We have an aging population, so we have people, more people entering this end of life period, and an aging caregiver population. And I just very briefly want to remind people that obviously end of life is a significant effect, event affecting the well being of people who are dying but it's also a significant event in the lives of the people who are caring for them. And there's a huge role for policy to improve the well-being of people that are providing care leading up to death and then in the grieving process thereafter. So what about home death? Why should we care about home death? Well, two reasons, very distinct. First, there's a well-established finding in the literature that people prefer, all else equal, if we can control, for pain well enough, prefer to die at home. And then there's this other very well-established literature that clearly demonstrates that the most expensive place to pass away is in an acute care hospital, and that there are major savings to be had if people pass away at home. So altogether, given these aligned objectives, this clear preference for dying at home and the well-established cost savings for, our, for the provincial government from home death, why is it that we still see Canadians or the majority of Canadians passing away in hospital? So the question we ask in this paper is more specific. Uh, we ask, what is the role of time and money in influencing home death? So let me take a second to explain what I mean by time and money. So if you're at the stage where, you know, death is coming close, you need help. You can't do this alone. So all provinces offer home care. Obviously, this varies significantly across provinces and also within provinces, depending on where you live, but that's never enough. So by time, I mean, you need help from your family, your friends to provide this care for you. And often this care is provided by family and friends at the same time as they are working in paid employment. Um, the money costs. So, so when I talk about time, just to be clear, I'm talking about caregiving time. Uh, and by money costs, what I really mean is that there are significant out-of-pocket costs associated with a home death. Uh, these could involve private assisted living arrangements, private home support services, perhaps drug and devices that are not covered by provincial programs. So in the paper, we give one example where this very home instead is this very broad, well-established service across Canada they charge about $65 an hour for a nurse, 35 for a personal support worker, and there's a minimum of three hours that you have to employ them. So if you need help every day, that adds up really quickly. All right, so what is the role of time and money in home death? Roseanne, I'm almost done. I'm going a little quick. It's okay, I can remember what's there. So we're, to do this story, we use the vital stats records from 2007 to 2019. And we're going to focus on cancer-related deaths. We're going to argue that given the progression of cancer, patients that are going to die of cancer often have the time to think and plan where their life will end. Thanks. So how does this work situate into the literature on location of death? The vast majority of the papers on this topic are really focusing on the lack of availability of options for where to pass away. Um, I'm going too slow. <laughs> outside of um, the lack of options outside of acute care hospital, that there are very other opportunities. The papers that I have listed here are those that uh, use data or statistical techniques to try to understand the factors influencing where to die. Broadly speaking, there's nothing really that talks about economic factors. Sometimes there's a mention in a small bit about education, but that's basically it. In Canada, the Wilson paper does look at trends in hospital deaths over time, so a declining trend over the two periods listed there. And the other three papers are really looking at small groups, very specific things. The Burge paper 
the probability of physician home visits for cancer patients in Nova Scotia, the Jayaraman and Joseph paper, there they're looking at uh, location of deaths in British Columbia, but focusing on um, predominantly interested in whether or not the, page, the decedent comes, was born in China or Canada. And the Sun, page, Sun et al. paper are looking at individuals who received palliative home care and looked at where they passed away. So very narrow. So in sum, we are examining the first to examine the role of time and money costs. So we use vital stats data. And when we started, we had this big dream, we're gonna go back decades and we will have everybody that, you know, the, sam the full sample of decedents. Unfortunately, data is not put together the same way. So we needed the location of death to be coded the same for everyone in our sample. So unfortunately, because each province collects this differently, we were, we've got a few more benign restrictions, but we ended up having to exclude Quebec, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and now all data previous to 2007. All right, so uh, just to be clear, in the data we use, location of death is uh, carefully located, defined as either hospital, private home, or outcome of interest, other healthcare facility, so either a nursing home, a long-term care home, or other location, and that would be for example, if someone passed away in a car accident. Excellent. So the full sample of decedents is about 2.2 million. When we restrict our sample to cancer decedents, that's about 29% of the sample. Cancer is the most common cause of death in, our, in Canada now. Uh, so our sample falls to 659,000. Excellent. So let me give you just very quickly some trends so you can see where things are heading in our country minus those three provinces. Uh, so if you follow the blue line left axis, you see that hospital deaths have fallen from close to 60% at the beginning of our sample down to about 53%. Home, home deaths, the red line, right axis, you can see they're increasing more slowly and they've plateaued the last couple of years. So that was all cause deaths. If we look just now at cancer deaths, we see very similar picture. Decedents of cancer are more likely to pass away in hospital and less likely at home. Just keep the one number in mind that the average across our sample of home deaths for cancer patients is about 18%. All right, very quickly, there's an interesting variation across provinces and Wilson points this out in their paper about uh, hospital deaths, that these differences are really a bit surprising across provinces and that there doesn't seem to be any policy that explains these, so potential area for future work. But you can see that Ontario, Nova Scotia is where you're more likely to pass away at home. New Brunswick and, uh, can't even see the bottom one, New Brunswick would be the places the least likely. Excellent. If we look quickly by cause of death, um, just to see how cancer relates to the other causes of death, we, you know, it's very much as expected. The trends are all the same in home death. Decedents of cardiovascular disease are the most likely to pass away at home. This kind of makes sense. Sometimes people die by having a cardiac event and then they're at home and that's just how they end. And uh, people who die of respiratory disease, well, the, that people with those conditions, they need a lot of technical equipment, making it much harder to be at home. Excellent. So, I think we're, yeah. So the rest, the, our contribution, our analysis, I should say, is divided into two parts. I'll present the simpler graphical analysis and I'll leave the more fun uh, regression analysis to my co-author, Roseanne. So in this part, we're going to look at just very simple cuts of the data, look at proxies for time costs. So proxies for having a caregiver and proxies for uh, money costs. So three proxies for time cost, sex, age, marital status. So here, the stories are very simple. Caregivers we know to be disproportionately female. So we expect all else equal, male decedents should be more likely to have a caregiver, thus more likely to pass away at home. Age, the, abil the ability to care for others decreases as we age. So we expect younger decedents, all else equal, should be more likely to have able caregivers. Marital status, the presence of a spouse of any age and sex increases the likelihood of having a caregiver. So married should be associated with more 
uh, home deaths. And we'll show you that's exactly what we see. Uh, the males, the blue line here, about one percentage point. So not that big, more likely to pass away at home, but consistent over the sample. Uh, if we look next at marital status, now we see a much more look seemingly important gap uh, about, what did, I, what did I say before? Five, six percentage points, married individuals, that much more likely, remember the base is 18%. So percentage wise, this is very big, more likely to pass away at home. And same thing by age group, the younger decedents clearly much more likely to pass away at home than the red line, the decedents over 75. Excellent. Money cost proxied for by income quintile. And here we see a very clear income gradient. Uh, those in the lowest income quintile, like six again, or seven percentage points, less likely to be passing away at home than the green line, the highest income quintiles. Excellent. So I'm just going to motivate for you the regression analysis. And here, those of you who are familiar with the work of Christopher Room and many co-authors, including Tammy, myself, who've looked here, worked on this, they're looking at the relationship between health and health behaviors over the business cycle, right? So there, what they're finding is that as the economy improves, our opportunity cost of time goes up. And what we find is that people are less likely to invest in time intensive, but health enhancing activities. So things like smoking, drinking, sleep, exercise, these all improve during recessionary times. All right, so how does that relate to this? Well, here we're, we were thinking, well, hey, wait, home death is produced, and I'm sorry if that term offends, uh, is produced using inputs of time and or money. So we suspected that as the economy, you know, fluctuates, so let's just go through this example, we, you know, the opportunity cost of time changes, and that could have an effect on home deaths. And maybe this will help us understand a bit more about the relative importance or the substitutability of these time and money inputs. So a little exercise we'll go through together. Imagine the economy, economic conditions worsen. So I'm doing the opposite example of what I said before. So the unemployment rates going up. So the opportunity cost of our time goes down. So time becomes cheap, money expensive. So we could see three things, right? We could see that as the unemployment rate goes up, we could see a decrease in home deaths, no change in home deaths, or an increase. Suppose we see a decrease in home death, right? So the unemployment rate's going up and we're producing fewer home deaths. Well, that means that we no longer have the inputs to produce the same amount of home deaths we did before. So we can't substitute the, the, uh, the cheaper, we can't substitute, you know, with using more the cheaper time for what was the more expensive money inputs, okay? So that would indicate that time and money are not substitutable and that money is the binding or important input. Suppose we see no change in home deaths. Well, that would suggest that time and money are perhaps very substitutable. So we produce the same number of home deaths and we're just maybe using less money, more time. Or it could be that neither input's really important in this production process. Or it could be that we see an increase in home deaths, right? So that all of a sudden that would be telling us that the money or that the time is the really important input because now that our time is cheaper, we're investing more in, of that input and producing an increased number of home deaths. So now I'll turn it to Roseanne to show you what we found. Okay. Ah. So, we did some regression analysis because one of the big advantages of regression analysis is, of course, that we can now control for all the factors that we think are associated with uh, whatever it is that we're interested in. And that's indeed what we do. And we layer in, of course, the um, impact of the unemployment rate, which is our um, proxy for economic conditions. So basically, we're looking at the likelihood of a home death by individual I, province P time T, a bunch of um, uh, factors that we've just discussed and including the exogenous variation in provincial unemployment rates. All right, so I want you to memorize this table because I'm going to ask you about it later. Now, I'm going to tell you what it is that I want you to look at on this table. So first of all, I mean, benignly, the OLS estimates and the probit estimates are virtually the same. Because, so we're just going to focus on the OLS estimates because they're easily more easily um, interpretable. 
So the first thing we want to draw your attention to is the importance of income. It comes as no surprise. We've seen that in the graphs, and now we're confirming it in the regression analysis, is that we have this positive monotonic relationship between income and um, and the likelihood of a home death. And we can see that the uh, the excluded category, quintile is the, is the middle income. So the two lower income, there's a negative uh, relationship. It, it gets the negative gets smaller as income goes up, but there's less relative to the middle income, a lower likelihood of a home death for those in the poorer um, quintiles. And um, of course, um, that um, reverses, and there's a higher likelihood of a home death for those in the higher um, income quintiles. The impact of being non-married is, uh, is quite stark. And um, we see that there's about a five percentage point difference in those non-married versus those married uh, in their uh, likelihood of having a home death. And that an, an implies a, you know, a large, let me just see, I have it here, I think 28% increase in the likelihood of a home death if you are married relative to those who are not married. So this is huge. Okay? Um, hmm, playing games. Age two matters. Uh, so the older the individual is, that it was paribus, the less likely that you're going to observe a home death. Partly, this could be explained by the less likely you have you are to have a an able uh, caregiver um, readily available. So that you know, we we think about it in that way. Rural is kind of interesting because um, what we have is a robustly positive impact of being in a rural area and having a home death. One explanation for that has to do with the closeness of these rural, uh, rural communities. Relative to an urban community, individuals in rural communities often get together, they're more supportive, and so we think that what we might be observing here is the supported the supportiveness of um, of a community in a, in helping to facilitate a home death. But the point the 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 important uh, variable as far as this regression analysis is concerned is the unemployment rate. So we turn now to the effect of the unemployment rate, and what we find is that it has consistently statistically significant negative association with home death. And now this is consistent with our two main results. Firstly, it seems that time and money are not easily substitutable in the production of home death. So the availability of more time, which we would expect as the unemployment rate goes up, um, cannot substitute for the lack of money. So money, um, so so we don't, we're, we're observing this lack of substitutability, and hence as the unemployment rate goes up, as economic conditions worsen, the, um, the probability of a home death falls. Uh, the second implication, which falls directly from the first, is that um, income matters. So money is a, an important, even more important input in the production of a home death than time. Now, to interpret the magnitude of these estimated coefficients, we follow um, Phil uh, Oriopoulos' uh, 2006 paper and with some co-authors uh, uh, where he um, estimates that there's about a five percentage point difference. A recession results in about a five percentage point um, uh, increase in the unemployment rate. So we say, well, let's suppose we have a five percentage point increase in the unemployment rate. Well, that means then that the uh, probability of a home death would uh, be reduced by one percent. And since the probability of a home death is 18 percent, then that results in it. So one percentage point is about a six percent reduction in the probability of a home death. So if you followed all of that, so bottom line is that, you know, the main result is that when you were in a, 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 a contraction, contractionary period, recessionary period, we're, we are expecting, so it was perilous, about a 6% reduction in the number of people who die at home. Okay, um, we now can look at, um, we, we ran all of these regressions by income quintile as well. And we're seeing, you know, that which we we saw um, earlier was sort of a different a different side of the of the same coin, I guess. That 
on the, the very low income and the high income behave differently than incomes in the middle. And so we have this kind of U shape where you know the, the fact that there's a, unemployment goes up has no impact on this low end of the distribution. Why? Well, likely because no matter whether they're employed or not employed, they can't afford a home death. Okay? Similarly, on the high end of the distribution, whether they're employed or unemployed, they can afford a home death. And so the unemployment rate is, is, is simply not a binding uh, uh, constraint in a way on the upper and lower uh, quintiles, but in the middle quintiles they are. So, so the unemployment rate is associated with an increase in, or a D, so the, in, if the unemployment rate goes up, it's associated with a decrease in the likelihood of a home death by the middle income Q, uh, Q uh, two, three, and four okay, uh, quintiles. So we did a whole bunch of things. And so we parsed the sample in, in several obvious ways to see whether this result, the result that the unemployment rate exerts a negative impact or is associated with a negative uh, reduction in the likelihood of a home death. So we did it in a number of obvious ways, male, female, by age groups, married, not married, urban, rural. So all of these uh, columns represent a uh, whole regression um, uh, analysis. And we've just put the full sample down just by way of comparison. So the, you know, overall, we see that it is always negative. It is not statistically uh, significant. So it's not very precise on the age groups, but it is always uh, a negative um, you know, across all the samples. Male and female, it, it has a stronger impact on the male population than on the female population. So this is, you know, as the unemployment rate goes up, we'll see fewer male, male home deaths than female uh, home deaths if we're comparing across the two samples. But nevertheless, it's an important uh, uh, effect. We see whether you're married or not married, um, also has uh, a, a strong uh, effect um, and it's the same effect and rural and urban it has a stronger effect on rural but it's still negative and it's still um, an important effect. Okay, so remember we said that was about 6% or so, it could be six a little bit more for when it's uh, at the three. Okay, so let's summarize the result. What have we found? Well, I, I think what we've demonstrated is that both time and money matter when it comes to producing a home death. The second thing we found is that the economic conditions and, pro and home deaths are pro-cyclical. So our estimates are suggesting there's somewhere around a 6% reduction in home deaths associated with a recession. Okay? Time and money are not easily substitutable in the production of home deaths. So in other words, if you have lots of time and not very much money, we're not, we're, you know, you, you don't seem to be able to support a home death. Uh, money seems to be almost more important, but it certainly um, is a key factor. So you can't substitute across the two. Um, and that's my second point here about it. So if you're going to discuss um, you know, more broadly what we've done, there are, of course, data limitations. There are always data limitations. The measurement of the location of death. Uh, so what we are measuring is exactly at the moment of death where you lo locate us. It could have been that you were in a hospital right up to the day before you went home and you died, and that would be counted as a home death. You know, similarly, you could have been at home all the way to the very end and you just went into the hospital and died and it would be counted as a hospital death. And so, you know, clearly that's a limitation to the data that we're using. Uh, socioeconomic status is proxied by the average income in the postal code of the, um, the decedent's um, place of residence. So, of course, that too is a, a pretty high level uh, proxy and having better information on that would be useful. And we've had to exclude, as, I, as we mentioned, some provinces uh, from the analysis. Now, there were a number of policies that could affect these home deaths. And, and in particular, um, the medical assistance in dying uh, 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 policy introduced in 2016 has the potential to increase the number of home deaths. Our data set, which ends in 2019, that, that was too short a period, and there were really quite few, not very many at all, uh, uh, made um, uh, 
deaths during that period. It has increased, and in 2021, they broadened the criteria. And so it is, you know, it is possible, and, and in fact, probably quite likely, that that will have an impact if we were to have, you know, better data, uh, we could probably pick that up. There are some uh, interprovincial differences in the generosity of home care uh, spending. We just, the, the data just weren't good enough and um, available enough really on that. We know that it exists, but you know, we can't, we, there was not a good measure, so we couldn't include that. And then we've got the compassionate care benefit policy introduced in 2004. In 2004, um, you know, quite a restricted definition of caregivers could get up to six weeks of this compassionate care benefit um, to look after a dying loved one. And then in 2016, it was modified to be six months. So that was a good thing insofar as it's much broader, but it's still only 55% of uh, average insurable earnings, which in 2021 was $56,000. So if you're, you know, if you, you know, you, this is really not the, the people who are likely to you'd want to benefit from it the people who don't have enough income probably don't have enough income because they're only going to get 55 percent of their earnings after that so it's not at all clear that this is going to have um, you know a big impact and in fact um 2021 data there was only about two and a half percent of deaths had a had a caregiver who had applied for these benefits so it's still very very small but in a bigger, just I, I'm running out of time, in a broader um, context here. So remember, when we started off the, the paper, we said, you know, we're, we're, this is, we're interested in the fact that individuals want to die at home, more or less. The government and healthcare system want us to die at home because it's really expensive for us to die in a hospital. And yet somehow we have this, you know, we, we're, we're not able to get these two things together. Why not? Well, one of the reasons why not is that benefits associated with not dying in the hospital, don't go to where you're dying. They stay in the hospital, okay? So you're getting benefits in the hospital uh, if you, you start dying at home. That's great for the hospital because you, you're freed up in acute care bed, except now you've got the costs associated with dying at home being borne by others. And so this whole siloing, if you like, of the way in which healthcare is financed is a real impede, you know, really impedes, it's an impediment to, what looks like a no-brainer. People want to die at home. It's cheaper if they die at home and, you know, they're not able to die at home. So that's something I think from a policy perspective, we think is an important, um, you know, broader implication. And of course, we're all aging and I'm kind of horrified because I was looking at those tables, those death tables and counting up how many years I have. And I, you know, I am quitting right now and going to the beach, but, you know, the baby boomers are aging. And they are, you know, they are, they're going to be looking for a place to hang their final hat. And so this problem just simply isn't going away. In fact, it's going to get, um, you know, more complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne. <laughs> I'm now thinking about heading to the beach as, as early as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm going to notice that we're, we're hitting the clock here at two o'clock. Um, I don't see any big questions popping up in the q and A. I, I do want to offer one very brief comment um, that came to mind while you're presenting, thinking about the the positive coefficient on that rural, you know, higher likelihood of of dying at home. You described that as thinking about there being a more supportive community and you know people around you to help. But I wonder if it also reflects many of the money costs associated with having to take some distance to a hospital and have family and friends staying in hotels and all of these kinds of problems. So, you know, maybe making use of the distance between your residence and the nearest health facility um, might be a way of, of helping tease that apart. And that might help you understand some of the provincial differences mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I, I do know that we're a bit out of time. So I think at this point, I'm going to thank everyone for these wonderful papers. I have to say, um, in going through the papers that went through these two special issues, there were a lot of amazing papers coming in. I encourage everybody to, to find those issues. Um, as I mentioned, they are both open access. But these were definitely two of my favorite papers um, in those special issues. So I was really happy to be able to come here today. Um, so I do thank you all for, for that. Um, with that, I will turn things back over to Grant, who I think is going to close us up for the day. I wasn't. I just I put him on the say, spot. <laughs> to say bye for bye to everyone also. Um, I just posted the links to those two special issues.
uh, in the chat if anyone's interested. Uh, thanks again to our presenters, wonderful papers. Um, do some research on a happier topic and come back and see us sometime. Have a great yes. day, everyone.